are coming um, in what is like sort of like the middle of the day um, to do a political event. And it's really hot, but I guess it's always hot here. I'm from Georgia, so I'm used to the hot. But at least we have humidity, so, uh, you know. But anyway, um, this is my second time in Arizona. The first time I was here, um, I was doing a fundraiser for a woman who had been elected to Congress with me back in 1992. 1994 was a really tough year. It's when the Republicans deluged America with their contract with America, but it was really a contract on America, uh, led by my fellow Georgian, Newt Gingrich, who just decided he was not going to run for president. And um, then now I'm back here again under uh, uh, completely different circumstances. Circumstances um, like, for example, I was stumping for Democrats, and now I'm stumping for Greens. Yeah. And um, there's a reason for that. And part of the reason doesn't have very much to do with the fact that I've never been supported by Democratic leadership in the state of Georgia, as y'all can imagine. <laughs> um, but really because the Democratic leadership in Washington, D.C. doesn't represent me anymore. And if they can win an election with the expectation from the American people of ending the war, and as Mike Gravel said, not only did they not end the war, but they are on the verge of funding and supporting yet another war, more war. And so now the very, the very character of our country is at stake. Who we are as Americans is at stake. What we stand for in the world, what we stand for at home, what we will tolerate, the injustices and the abuses that we will stand for at home is at stake. And so armed with the knowledge of what it is that our country ought to be doing in terms of domestic policy, what our country ought to be doing in terms of foreign policy, what our country ought to be doing in terms of even its own military policy, and what we ought to be doing with the highest statement of our values, which is our national budget, and hiding from the people that we have just allowed indebtedness of our country to go up to nearly $10 trillion, and hiding that from the people at the same time we're funding more, it's now important that all of us take a stand. Yes. How in the world can we sustain the injuries from September 11th and not even ask any questions about what happened on that day? Uh, How yeah. is it <laughs> that we can invest as a country trillions of dollars in a military and an intelligence infrastructure and it failed four times on one day. And then the, ex the explanation that they give us is that they hate us because we are free. <laughs> now, they actually passed out talking points. And they said that this is what we're supposed to go back and tell our constituents, that they hate us because we are free. My constituents were, were scared. They were frightened. They were concerned. They were wondering if Atlanta was going to be next. And the only thing I was charged with explaining to them was they hate us because we're free. And that was supposed to be sufficient. Well, it wasn't sufficient for me. And so then when I saw, I was reading the international press, but then when I saw that Bush 
contacted Tom Daschle, who was the majority leader at the time, and said, don't investigate September 11th. And then when I read that Dick Cheney also contacted Tom Daschle and said, don't investigate September 11th, I said, when a train wrecks, we have an investigation. How can we not have an investigation when an institution that is charged with projection of our military around the world can't even protect its own headquarters at home. How can we dare not have an investigation? I thought that the failure of the Bush administration to protect the American people on September 11th in and of itself constituted high crimes and misdemeanors. Yeah. And I hand wrote articles of impeachment, but my mother begged me, leave it alone, Cynthia, because they will kill you. Even today, she is concerned about my security. Those of you who have seen American Blackout, you know the stalkers. The uh, What you don't know is that we got death threats. It, they, I mean, it came from the fact that I was the first black woman elected to Congress, Georgia, going into rural Georgia, folks had to get accustomed. The folks looking like me actually saying, I want to help you, I want to solve your problems, please talk to me. They had to get used to that. And some places, they weren't ready to accept that in 20th century Georgia. And so we had to quietly and gently inform them that yes, there is something called the Civil Rights Act. And young <laughs> black kids can walk down the street if they want to. And they can go into a shop if they want to, and they can buy your merchandise if they want to. This is 1993 in Georgia. And yes, there is something called the Voting Rights Act. And so you cannot only put voting places in places where black people are afraid to go. You cannot do that anymore. We had to be very gentle with them, but we had to nudge them and pull them into the 20th century, and we did. And as a result of our success, guess what happened? They dismantled the district, because what they don't want is black people in the Georgia setting is black people and white people. They don't want black people and white people coming together, because guess what? You will want an agenda for justice. You want an agenda for change. Yeah. 